Act Four of The Blunderer or The Counterplots by Moliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene One Lelio, disguised as an Armenian, Masqueril. You are dressed in a most comical fashion. I had abandoned all hope. But you have revived it again by this contrivance. My anger is always too soon over. It is vain to swear and curse. I can never keep to my oaths. Be assured that if ever it lies in my power, you shall be satisfied with the proofs of my gratitude. And though I have but one piece of bread... Enough. Study well this new project. For if you commit now any blunder... You cannot lay the blame upon ignorance of the plot. You ought to know your part in the play perfectly by heart. But how did Trafalden receive you? I cozened the good fellow with a pretended zeal for his interests. I went with alacrity to tell him that, unless he took very great care, some people would come and surprise him, that from different quarters they had designs upon her of whose origin a letter had given a false account that they would have liked to draw me in for a share of the business but that i kept well out of it and that being full of zeal for what so nearly concerned him i came to give him timely notice that he might take his precautions uh, then moralizing i discourse solemnly about the many rogueries one sees every day here below that is for me being tired with the world and its infamies i wish to work out my soul's salvation retire from all its noise and live with some worthy honest man with whom i could spend the rest of my days in peace that if he had no objection i should desire nothing more than to pass the remainder of my life with him that i had taken such a liking to him that without asking for any wages to serve him i was ready to place in his hands knowing it to be safe there some property my father had left me as well as my savings which i was fully determined to leave to him alone if it pleased heaven to take me hence that was the right way to gain his affection you and your beloved should decide what means to use to attain your wishes i was anxious to arrange a secret interview between you two he himself has contrived to show me a most excellent method by which you may fairly and openly stay in her house happening to talk to me about a son he had lost and whom he dreamt last night had come to life again he told me the following story upon which just now i founded my stratagem enough i know it all you have told me twice already though lelio says to masqueril enough i know it all he has not been listening to the speech of his servant but in the meanwhile is arranging his dress and smoothing his ruffles, and making it clear to the spectator that he knows nothing, and that he will be a bad performer of the part assigned to him. This explains the blunders he makes afterwards in the second and fifth scenes of the same act. Yes, yes, but even if I should tell it thrice, it may happen still that with all your conceit you might break down in some minor detail. I long to be at it already pray not quite so fast for we might stumble your skull is rather thick therefore you should be perfectly well instructed in your part some time ago trufalden left naples his name was then zanobio roberti being suspected in his native town of having participated in a certain rebellion raised by some political faction though really he is not a man to disturb any state he was obliged to quit it stealthily by night leaving behind him his daughter who was very young and his wife some time afterwards he received the news that they were both dead and in this perplexity wishing to take with him to some other town not only his property but also the only one who was left of all his family his young son a schoolboy called horatio he went to bologna where a certain tutor named alberto had taken the boy when very young to finish there his education but though for two whole years he appointed several times to meet them they never made their appearance believing them to be dead after so long a time he came to this city 
where he took the name he now bears without for twelve years ever having discovered any traces of this alberto or of his son horatio this is the substance of the story which i have repeated so that you may better remember the groundwork of the plot now you are to personate an armenian merchant who has seen them both safe and sound in turkey if i have invented this scheme in preference to any other of bringing them to life again according to his dream it is because it is very common in adventures for people to be taken at sea by some turkish pirate and afterwards restored to their families in the very nick of time when thought lost for fifteen or twenty years for my part i have heard a hundred of that kind of stories without giving ourselves the trouble of inventing something fresh let us make use of this one what does it matter you must say you heard the story of their being made slaves from their own mouths and also that you lent them money to pay their ransom and that as urgent business obliged you to set out before them horatio asked you to go and visit his father here whose adventures he was acquainted with and with whom you were to stay a few days till their arrival i have given you a long lesson now oh, these repetitions are superfluous from the very beginning i understood it all i shall go in and prepare the way listen Masquerade. there is only one thing that troubles me suppose he should ask me to describe his son's countenance there is no difficulty in answering that you know he was very little when he saw him last besides it is very likely that increase of years and slavery have completely changed him that is true but pray if he should remember my face what must i do then you have no memory at all i told you just now that he has merely seen you for a minute that therefore you could only have produced a very transient impression on his mind besides your beard and dress disguise you completely very well but now i think of it what part of turkey it is all the same i tell you turkey or barbary oh but what is the name of the town i saw them in tunis i think he will keep me till night he tells me it is useless to repeat that name so often and i have already mentioned it a dozen times go go in and prepare matters i want nothing more be cautious at least and act wisely let us have none of your inventions here let me alone trust to me i say once more observe horatio a schoolboy in bologna trufalvin his true name zanobio roberti a citizen of naples the tutor was called alberto you make me blush by preaching so much to me do you think i am a fool no not completely uh, but something very like it scene two lilio alone when i do not stand in need of him he cringes but now because he very well knows of how much use he is to me his familiarity indulges in such remarks as he just now made I shall bask in the sunshine of those beautiful eyes, which hold me in so sweet captivity, and without hindrance depict in the most glaring colours the tortures I feel. I shall then know my fate. But here they are. Scene three. Trafalden, Lilio, Masqueril. Thanks, righteous heaven, for this favourable turn of my fortune. You are the man to see visions and dream dreams since you prove how untrue is the saying that dreams are falsehoods how can i thank you what returns can i make you sir you whom i ought to style the messenger sent from heaven to announce my happiness these compliments are superfluous i can dispense with them trifaldin to masqueril i have seen somebody like this armenian but i do not know where that is what i was saying but one sees surprising likenesses sometimes you have seen that son of mine in whom all my hopes are centred yes signor trifaldin and he was as well as well can be he related to you his life and spoke much about me did he not more than ten thousand times not quite so much i should say he described you just as i see you your face your gait is that possible 
he has not seen me since he was seven years old and even his tutor after so long a time would scarcely know my face again one's own flesh and blood never forget the image of one's relations this likeness is imprinted so deeply that my father hold your tongue where was it you left him in turkey at turin turin but i thought that town was in piedmont oh the dunce to trifaldin you do not understand him he means tunis it was in reality there he left your son but the armenians always have a certain vicious pronunciation which seems very harsh to us the reason of it is because in all their words they change nis into rin and so instead of saying tunis they pronounce turin i ought to know this in order to understand him did he tell you in what way you could meet with his father what answer will he give trifaldin having found out that mascarille makes signs to his master the servant pretends to fence to trifaldin after pretending to fence i was just practising some passes i have handled the foils in many a fencing school trifaldin to mascarille that is not the thing i wish to know now to Lilio. what other name did he say i went by ah oh. Uh, Signor Zaboni Robert, how glad you ought to be for what heaven sends you. That is your real name. The other is assumed. But where did he tell you he first saw the light? Naples seems a very nice place, but you must feel a decided aversion to it. Can you not let us go on with our conversation without interrupting us? Naples is the place where he first drew his breath whither did i send him in his infancy and under whose care that poor albert behaved very well for having accompanied your son from bologna whom you committed to his care pshaw mascarille aside oh we are undone if this conversation lasts long i should very much like to know their adventures aboard what ship did my adverse fate I do not know what is the matter with me. I do nothing but yawn. But, Signor Trufalden, uh, perhaps this stranger may want some refreshment. Besides, it grows late. No refreshment for me. Oh, sir, you are more hungry than you imagine. Please to walk in, then. After you, sir. Mascarille to Trufalden. Sir, in Armenia, the masters of the house use no ceremony to lilio after trifaldin has gone in poor fellow have you not a word to say for yourself he surprised me at first but never fear i have rallied my spirits and am going to rattle away boldly here comes our rival who knows nothing of our plot they go into trifaldin's house scene four anselmo leander stay leander and allow me to tell you something which concerns your peace and reputation i do not speak to you as the father of hippolyta as a man interested for my own family but as your father anxious for your welfare without wishing to flatter you or to disguise anything in short openly and honestly as i would wish a child of mine to be treated upon the like occasion do you know how everybody regards this amour of yours which in one night has burst forth how your yesterday's undertaking is everywhere talked of and ridiculed what people think of the whim which they say has made you select for a wife a gipsy outcast a strolling wench whose noble occupation was only begging i really blushed for you even more than i did for myself who am also compromised by this public scandal yes i am compromised i say i whose daughter being engaged to you cannot bear to see her slighted without taking offence at it for shame leander 
arise from your humiliation consider well your infatuation if none of us are wise at all times yet the shortest errors are always the best when a man receives no dowry with his wife but beauty only repentance follows soon after wedlock and the handsomest woman in the world can hardly defend herself against the lukewarmness caused by possession i repeat it those fervent raptures those youthful ardours and ecstasies <laughs> may make us pass a few agreeable nights <laughs> but this bliss is not at all lasting and as our passions grow cool very unpleasant days follow those pleasant nights hence proceed cares anxieties miseries sons disinherited through their father's wrath all that i now hear from you is no more than what my own reason has already suggested to me I know how much I am obliged to you for the great honour you were inclined to pay me, and of which I am unworthy. In spite of the passion which sways me, I have ever retained a just sense of your daughter's merit and virtue. Therefore I will endeavour. Somebody is opening this door. Let us retire to a distance, lest some contagion spreads from it, which may attack you suddenly. Scene 5 Lilio, Masqueril. We shall soon see our roguery miscarry if you persist in such palpable blunders. Must I always hear your reprimands? What can you complain of? Have I not done admirably since? Only middling. For example, you called the Turks heretics, and you affirmed on your corporal oath that they worshipped the sun and moon as their gods. Let that pass. What vexes me most is that when you are with Celia, you strangely forget yourself. Your love is like porridge, which by too fierce a fire swells, mounts up to the brim, and runs over everywhere. Could any one be more reserved? As yet, I have hardly spoken to her. You are right, but it is not enough to be silent. You had not been a moment at table till your gestures rouse more suspicion than other people would have excited in a whole twelvemonth. How so? How so? Everybody might have seen it. At table where Trufaldin made her sit down, you never kept your eyes off her, blushed, looked quite silly, cast sheep eyes at her, without ever minding what you were helped to. You were never thirsty but when she drank, and took the glass eagerly from her hands and without rinsing it or throwing a drop of it away, you drank what was left in it, and seemed to choose in preference that side of the glass which her lips had touched. Upon every piece which her slender hand had touched, or which she had bit, you laid your paw as quickly as a cat does upon a mouse, and you swallowed it as glibly as if you were a regular glutton. Then, besides all this, you made an intolerable noise, shuffling with your feet under the table, for which Trufaldin, who received two lusty kicks, twice punished a couple of innocent dogs, who would have growled at you if they dared. And yet, in spite of all of this, you say you behaved finely. For my part, I sat upon thorns all the time. Notwithstanding the cold, I feel even now in a perspiration. I hung over you just as a bowler does over his bowl after he has thrown it and thought to restrain your actions by contorting my body ever so many times. Lack a day! How easy it is for you to condemn things of which you do not feel the enchanting cause! In order to humour you for once, I have, nevertheless, a good mind to put a restraint upon that love which sways me. Henceforth. Scene 6. Trafalden, Lilio, Masqueril. We were speaking about your son's adventures. Trafalden, to Lilio. You did quite right. Will you do me the favour of letting me have one word when private with him? I should be very rude if I did not. Lilio goes in to Trafalden's house. Scene 7. Trafalden, Masqueril. Hark ye, 
do you know what I have just been doing? No, but if you think it proper, I shall certainly not remain long in ignorance. I have just now cut off from a large and sturdy oak of about two hundred years old an admirable branch, selected on purpose of tolerable thickness, of which immediately upon the spot I made a cudgel, about, yes, of this size. Showing his arm. Not so thick at one end as at the other, but fitter, I imagine, than thirty switches to belabor the shoulders withal, for it is well poised, green, knotty, and heavy. But pray for whom is all this preparation? For yourself, first of all, and then secondly, for that fellow, who wishes to palm one person upon me, and trick me out of another. For this Armenian, this merchant in disguise, introduced by a lying and pretended story. What? You do not believe... Do not try to find an excuse. He himself, fortunately, discovered his own stratagem, by telling Celia, while he squeezed her hand at the same time, that it was for her sake alone he came disguised in this manner. He did not perceive Jeanette, my little goddaughter, who overheard every word he said. Though your name was not mentioned, I do not doubt but you are a cursed accomplice in all this. Indeed, you wrong me. If you are really deceived, believe me, I was the first imposed upon with his story. Would you convince me you speak the truth? Assist me in giving him a sound drubbing and driving him away. Let us give it the rascal well, and then I will acquit you of all participation in this piece of rascality. I, I with all my soul, I will dust his jacket for him so soundly that you shall see I had no hand in the matter. Aside. Ah, you shall have a good licking, Mr. Armenian, who always spoil everything. Scene 8. Lelio, Trifaldin, Mascarille. Trifaldin knocks at his door and then addresses Lelio. A word with you, if you please. So, Mr. Cheat, you have the assurance to fool the respectable man and make a game of him? To pretend to have seen his son abroad in order to get the more easily into his house. Trifaldin, beating Lelio. Go away! Go away immediately! Lelio, to Mascarille, who beats him likewise. Oh, you scoundrel! It is thus the rogues... Villain! ...are served here. Keep that for my sake. What? Is a gentleman! Mascarille, beating him and driving him off. March off. Be gone, I tell you. Or I shall break all the bones in your body. I am delighted with this. Come in. I am satisfied. Mascarille follows Trifaldin into his house. Lelio, returning. This to me! To be thus affronted by a servant! Could I have thought the wretch would have dared thus to ill-treat his master? Mascarille, from Trifaldin's window. May I take the liberty to ask how your shoulders are? What? Have you the impudence still to address me? Now see what it is not to have perceived Jeanette and to have always a babbling tongue in your head. However, this time I am not angry with you. I have done cursing and swearing at you, though you behave very imprudently, yet my hand has made your shoulders pay for your fault. Ha! I shall be revenged on you for your treacherous behavior. You yourself were the cause of all this mischief. I? Ah, oh, if you had a grain of sense when you were talking to your idol you would have perceived Jeanette at your heels, whose sharp ears overheard the whole affair. Could anybody possibly catch one word I spoke to Celia? And what else was the cause why you were suddenly turned out of doors? Yes, you are shut out by your own tittle-tattle. I do not know whether you play often at piquette, but you at least throw your cards away in an admirable manner. Oh! I am the most unhappy of all men. But why did you drive me away also? I never did better than in acting thus. By these means, at least I prevent all suspicion 
of my being the inventor or an accomplice of this stratagem but you should have laid it on more gently i was no such fool trufaldin watched me most narrowly besides i must tell you under the pretense of being of use to you i was not at all displeased to vent my spleen however the thing is done and if you will give me your word of honour never directly or indirectly to be revenged on me for the blows on the back i so heartily gave you i promise you by the help of my present station to satisfy your wishes within these two nights though you have treated me very harshly yet what would not such a promise prevail upon me to do you promise then yes i do but that is not all promise never to meddle in anything i take in hand i do if you break your word may you get the cold shivers then keep it with me and do not forget my uneasiness go and change your dress and rub something on your back lelio alone will old luck always follow me and heap upon me one misfortune after another Mascarille coming out of trifaldin's house what not gone yet hence immediately but above all be sure you don't trouble your head about anything be satisfied that i am on your side do not make the least attempt to assist me remain quiet lelio going yes to be sure i will remain quiet Mascarille alone now let me see what course i am to steer scene nine ergast masqueril masqueril i come to tell you a piece of news which will give a cruel blow to your projects at the very moment i am talking to you a young gypsy who nevertheless is no black and looks like a gentleman has arrived with a very wan-looking old woman and is to call upon truffledine to purchase the slave you wish to redeem he seems to be very anxious to get possession of her doubtless it is the lover celia spoke about wherever fortune so tangled as ours no sooner have we got rid of one trouble than we fall into another in vain do we hear that leander intends to abandon his pursuit and to give us no further trouble that the unexpected arrival of his father has turned the scales in favour of hippolyta that the old gentleman has employed his parental authority to make a thorough change and that the marriage contract is going to be signed this very day as soon as one rival withdraws another and a more dangerous one starts up to destroy what little hope there was left however by a wonderful stratagem i believe i shall be able to delay their departure and gain what time i want to put the finishing stroke to this famous affair a great robbery has lately been committed by whom nobody knows these gypsies have not generally the reputation of being very honest upon this slight suspicion i will cleverly get the fellow imprisoned for a few days i know some officers of justice open to a bribe who will not hesitate on such an occasion greedy and expecting some present there is nothing they will not attempt with their eyes shut be the accused ever so innocent the purse is always criminal and must pay for the offence end of act four Act Five of The Blunderer or The Counterplots by Moliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Five, Scene One, Mascarill, Ergast. Ah, blockhead, numbskull, idiot, will you never leave off persecuting me? the constable took great care everything was going on smoothly the fellow would have been in jail had not your master come up that very moment and like a madman spoiled your plot i cannot suffer says he in a loud voice that a respectable man should be dragged to prison in this disgraceful manner 
I will be responsible for him from his very looks and will be his bail. And as they refused to let him go, he immediately and so vigorously attacked the officers, who are a kind of people much afraid of their carcasses, that even at this very moment they are running and every man thinks he has got a Lelio at his heels. The fool does not know that this gypsy is in the house all ready to carry off his treasure. Goodbye. Business obliges me to leave you. Scene 2. Masqueril Alone. Yes, this less marvellous accident quite stuns me. One would think, and I have no doubt of it, that this bungling devil which possesses Lelio takes delight in defying me, and leads him into every place where his presence can do mischief. Yet I shall go on, and notwithstanding all these buffets of fortune, try who will carry the day. Celia has no aversion to him, and looks upon her departure with great regret. I must endeavor to improve this opportunity. Ah, but here they come. Let me consider how I shall execute my plan. Yonder furnished house is at my disposal, and I can do what I like with it. If fortune but favors us, all will go well. Nobody lives there but myself, and I keep the key. Good heavens, what a great many adventures have befallen us in so short a time, and what numerous disguises a rogue is obliged to put on. Scene 3. Celia, Andres. And you know it, Celia. I have left nothing undone to prove the depth of my passion. When I was but very young, my courage in the wars gained me some consideration among the Venetians, and one time or other, and without having too great an opinion of myself, I might, had I continued in their service, have risen to some employment of distinction. But for your sake, I abandoned everything. The sudden change you produced in my heart was quickly followed by your lover joining the gypsies. Neither a great many adventures, nor your indifference, have been able to make me abandon my pursuit. Since your time, being by an accident separated from you much longer than I could have foreseen, I spared neither time nor pains to meet with you again. At last I discovered the gypsy woman, and heard from her that for a certain sum of money, which was then of great consequence to the gypsies, and prevented the dissolution of the whole band, you are left in pledge in this neighborhood. Full of impatience, I flew hither immediately to break these mercenary chains, and to receive from you whatever commands you might be pleased to give. But when I thought to see joy sparkle in your eyes, I found you pensive and melancholy. If quietness has charms for you, I have sufficient means at Venice of the spoils taken in war for us both to live there. But if I must still follow you as before, I will do so, and my heart shall have no other ambition than to serve you in whatever manner you please. You openly display your affection for me. I should be ungrateful not to be sensible of it. Besides, just now, my countenance does not bear the impress of the feelings of my heart. My looks show that I have a violent headache. If I have the least influence over you, you will delay our voyage for at least three or four days, until my indisposition has passed away. I shall stay as long as you like. I only wish to please you. Let us look for a house where you may be comfortable. Oh, here is a bill, just up at the right time. Scene 4. Celia, 
Andres, Mascarille, disguised as a Swiss. Monsieur Swiss, are you the master of the house? I am at your service. Can we lodge here? Yes, I let furnished lodging to strangers, but only to respectable people. I suppose your house has a very good reputation? I see by your face you are a stranger in this town. I am. Are you the husband of this lady? Sir? Is she your wife or your sister? Neither. Upon my word, she is very pretty. Do you come on business, or have you a lawsuit going on before the court? A lawsuit is a very bad thing. It costs so much money. A solicitor is a thief and a barrister a rogue. I do not come for either of these. You have brought this young lady, then, to walk about and to see the town? What is that to you? To Celia. I shall be with you again in one moment. I am going to fetch the old woman presently and tell them not to send a travelling carriage which was ready is the lady quite well she has an headache i have some good wine and cheese within walk in go into my small house celia andres and mascarille go into the house scene five lelio alone however impatient and excited i may feel Yet I have pledged my word to do nothing but wait quietly, to let another work for me, and to see, without daring to stir, in what manner heaven will change my destiny. Scene 6. Andres, Lilio. Lilio, addressing Andres, who is coming out of the house. Do you want to see anybody in this house? I have just taken some furnished apartments there. The house belongs to my father and my servant sleeps there every night to take care of it. I know nothing of that. The bill at least shows it to be let. Read it. Truly, this surprises me, I confess. Who the deuce can have put that bill up, and why? Oh, faith, I can guess, pretty near, what it means. This cannot possibly proceed, but from the quarter I surmise. May I ask what affair this may be? I would keep it carefully from anybody else, but it can be of no consequence to you, and you will not mention it to anyone. Without doubt, that bill can be nothing else but an invention of the servant I spoke of, nothing but some cunning plot he has hatched to place into my hands a certain gypsy girl, with whom I am smitten, and of whom I wish to obtain possession. I have already attempted this several times, but until now in vain. What is her name? Celia what do you say had you but mentioned this no doubt i should have saved you all the trouble this project costs you how so do you know her it is i who just now bought her from her master you surprise me as the state of her health did not allow her to leave this town i just took these apartments for her and I am very glad that on this occasion you have acquainted me with your intentions. What? Shall I obtain the happiness I hope for by your means? Could you... Andres knocks at the door. You shall be satisfied immediately. What can I say to you? And what thanks? No, give me none. I will have none. Scene 7 Lilio, Andres, Mascarille. Mascarille, aside. Hello, is this not my madcap master? He will make another blunder. Who would have known him in this grotesque dress? Come hither, Mascarille. You are welcome. I am a man of honor. I am not Mascarille. I have never debauched any married or unmarried woman. What funny gibberish! It is really very good. Go about your business and do not laugh at me. You can take off your dress, recognize your master. Upon my word, by all the saints, I never knew you. Everything is settled. Disguise yourself no longer. If you do not go away, I will give you a slap in the face. Your Swiss jargon is needless, I tell you. 
for we are agreed and his generosity lays me under an obligation i have all i can wish for you have no reason to be under any farther apprehension if you are agreed by great good luck i will no longer play the swiss and become myself again this valet of yours serves you with much zeal stay a little i will return presently scene eight lelio masqueril well what do you say now that i am delighted to see our labours crowned with success you are hesitating to doff your disguise i could hardly believe me as i know you i was rather afraid and still find the adventure very astonishing but confess however that i have done great things at least i have now made amends for all my blunders mine will be the honour of having finished the work be it so you have been much more lucky than wise scene nine celia andres lilio mascaril is not this the lady you were speaking of to me heavens what happiness can be equal to mine it is true i am indebted to you for the kindness you have shown me i should be much to blame if i did not acknowledge it but this kindness would be too dearly bought were i to repay it at the expense of my heart judge by the rapture her beauty causes me whether i ought to discharge my debt to you at such a price you are generous and would not have me act thus farewell let us return whence we came and stay there for a few days he leads celia away scene ten lilio mascaril i am laughing and yet i have little inclination to it you two are quite of the same mind he gives celia to you hem you understand me sir this is too much i am determined no longer to ask you to assist me it is useless i am a puppy a wretch a detestable blockhead not worthy of any one taking any trouble for me incapable of doing anything abandon all endeavours to aid an unfortunate wretch who will not allow himself to be made happy after so many misfortunes after all my imprudent actions death alone shall aid me scene eleven masqueril alone that is the true way of putting the finishing stroke to his fate he wants nothing now but to die to crown all his follies but in vain his indignation for all the faults he has committed urges him to renounce my aid and my support i intend happen what will to serve him in spite of himself and vanquish the very devil that possesses him the greater the obstacle the greater the glory and the difficulties which beset us are but a kind of tired women who deck and adorn virtue scene twelve celia masqueril celia to masqueril who has been whispering to her whatever you may say and whatever they intend doing i have no great expectation from this delay what we have seen hitherto may indeed convince us that they are not as yet likely to agree i have already told you that a heart like mine will not for the sake of one do an injustice to another and that i find myself strongly attached to both though by different ties if lelio has love and its power on his side andre has gratitude pleading for him which will not permit even my most secret thoughts ever to harbour anything against his interests yes if he has no longer a place in my heart if the gift of my hand must not crown his love i ought at least to reward that which he has done for me by not choosing another in contempt of his flame and suppress my own inclinations in the same manner as i do his you have heard the difficulties which duty throws in my way and you can judge now whether your expectations will be realized to speak the truth they are very formidable obstacles in our way and i have not the knack of working miracles but i will do my utmost move heaven and earth leave no stone unturned 
to try and discover some happy expedient. I shall soon let you know what can be done. Scene 13. Hippolyta, Celia. Ever since you came among us, the ladies of this neighborhood may well complain of the havoc caused by your eyes, since you deprive them of the greatest part of their conquests and make all their lovers faithless. There is not a heart which can escape the darts with which you pierce them as soon as they see you. Many thousands load themselves with your chains and seem to enrich you daily at our expense. However, as regards myself, I should make no complaints of the irresistible sway of your exquisite charms had they left me one of my lovers to console me for the loss of the others. But it is inhuman in you that without mercy you deprive me of all. I cannot forbear complaining to you. You rally in a charming manner, but I beseech you to spare me a little. Those eyes, those very eyes of yours, know their own power too well ever to dread anything that I am able to do. They are too conscious of their own charms and will never entertain similar feelings of fear. Yet I advance nothing in what I have said which has not already entered the mind of every one, and without mentioning anything else, it is well known that Celia has made a deep impression on Leander and on Lelio. I believe you will easily console yourself about their loss, since they have become so infatuated, nor can you regret a lover who could make so ill a choice. On the contrary, I am of quite a different opinion and discover such great merits in your beauty, and see in it so many reasons sufficient to excuse the inconstancy of those who allow themselves to be attracted by it, that I cannot blame Leander for having changed his love and broken his plighted troth. In a short time, and without either hatred or anger, I shall see him again brought under my sway, when his father shall have exercised his authority. Scene 14. Celia, Hippolyta, Masqueril. Great news! Great news! A wonderful event I am now going to tell you. What means this? Listen. This is without any compliments. What? The last scene of a true and genuine comedy. The old gypsy woman was but this very moment. Well? Crossing the marketplace, thinking about nothing at all, when another old woman, very haggard-looking, after having closely stared at her for some time, hoarsely broke out in a torrent of abusive language, and thus gave the signal for a furious combat, in which instead of swords, muskets, daggers, or arrows, nothing was seen but four withered paws brandished in the air, with which these two combatants endeavored to tear off the little flesh old age had left on their bones. Not a word was heard but drab, wretch, troll. Their caps to begin with were flying about and left a couple of bald pates exposed to view, which rendered the battle ridiculously horrible. At the noise and the hubbub, Andres and Trufalden, as well as many others, ran to see what was the matter, and had much ado to part them, so excited were they by passion. Meanwhile, each of them, when the storm was abated, endeavored to hide her head with shame everybody wished to know the cause of this ridiculous fray she who first began it having notwithstanding the wrath of her passion looked for some time at trufalden said in a loud voice it is you unless my sight misgives me who i was informed lived privately in this town most happy meeting yes signor zanobio roberti Fortune made me find you out at the very moment I was giving myself so much trouble for your sake. When you left your family at Naples, your daughter, as you know, remained under my care. I brought her up from her youth. When she was only four years old, she showed already in a thousand different ways what charms and beauty she would have. That woman you see there, that infamous hag, who had rather become intimate with us, robbed me of that treasure. Your good lady, alas, felt so much grief at this misfortune, that, as I have reason to believe, it shortened her days. So that, fearing your severe reproaches, because your daughter had been stolen from me, 
I sent you word that both were dead. But now, as I have found out the thief, she must tell us what has become of your child. At the name of Zambonio Ruberte, which she repeated several times throughout the story, Andres, after changing color often, addressed to the surprised Trufald in these words. What? Has heaven most happily brought me to him whom I have hitherto sought in vain? Can I possibly have beheld my father? the author of my being without knowing him yes father i am horatio your son my tutor albert having died i felt a new certain uneasiness in my mind left bologna and abandoning my studies wandered about for six years in different places according as my curiosity led me however after the expiration of that time a secret impulse drove me to revisit my kindred and my native country. But in Naples, alas, I could no longer find you, and could only hear vague reports concerning you, so that having in vain tried to meet with you, I ceased to roam about idly and stopped for a while in Venice. From that time to this, I have lived without receiving any other information about my family except knowing its name. You may judge whether Trufaldin was not more than ordinarily moved all this while. In one word, to tell you shortly that which you will have an opportunity of learning afterwards more to your leisure, from the confession of the old gypsy woman, Trufaldin owns you. Now, for his daughter, Andres is your brother, and as he can no longer think of marrying his sister, and as he acknowledges he is under some obligation to my master, Lelio, he has obtained for him your hand. Pandolphus, being present at this discovery, gives his full consent to the marriage, and to complete the happiness of the family, proposes that the newly found Horatio should marry his daughter. See how many incidents are produced at one and the same time. Such tidings perfectly amaze me. The whole company follow me, except the two female champions who are adjusting their toilet after the fray. Leander and your father are also coming. I shall go and inform my master of this, and let him know that what we thought obstacles were increasing. Heaven almost wrought a miracle in his favor. Exit Mascarille. <sighs> this fortunate event fills me with as much as joy as if it were my own case. But here they come. Scene 15. Trifaldin. Anselmo, Andres, Celia, Hippolyta, Leander. My child! Father! Do you already know how heaven has blessed us? I have just now heard this wonderful event. Hippolyta, to Leander. You need not find excuses for your past infidelity. The cause of it, which I have before my eyes, is a sufficient excuse i crave nothing but a generous pardon i call heaven to witness that though i return to my duty suddenly my father's authority has influenced me less than my own inclination andres to celia who could ever have supposed that so chaste a love would one day be condemned by nature however honour swayed it always so much that with a little alteration it may still continue as for me i blamed myself and thought i was wrong because i felt nothing but a very sincere esteem for you i could not tell what powerful obstacle stopped me in a path so agreeable and so dangerous and diverted my heart from acknowledging a love which my senses endeavoured to communicate to my soul trifaldin to celia but what would you say of me if, as soon as I have found you, I should be thinking of parting with you? I promised your hand to this gentleman's son. I know no will but yours. Scene 16. Trifaldin, Anselmo, Pandolphus, Celia, Hippolyta, Lelio, Leander, Andres, Mascarille. Now let us see whether this devil of yours will have the power to destroy so solid a foundation as this. 
and whether your inventive powers will again strive against this great good luck that befalls you through a most unexpected favorable turn of fortune your desires are crowned with success and celia is yours am i to believe that the omnipotence of heaven yes son-in-law it is really so the matter is settled andres to lelio by this i repay the obligation you lay me under lelio to mascareel i must embrace you ever so many times in this great joy oh oh gently i beseech you he has almost choked me i am very much afraid for celia if you embrace her so forcibly one can do very well without such proofs of affection trifaldin to lelio you know the happiness with which heaven has blessed me but since the same day has caused us all to rejoice let us not part until it is ended and let leander's father also be sent for quickly you are all provided for is there not some girl who might suit poor masqueril as i see every jack has his jill i also want to be married <laughs> i have a wife for you let us go then and may propitious heaven give us children whose fathers we really are end of act five end of the blunderer or the counterplots by moliere